Good afternoon. It's my honor and privilege to be here, and, and I'm the old dog. <laughs> so one of the things that's so um, important uh, for us all to remember, uh, one of the reasons uh, that I wanted to come here and to be here uh, is to celebrate the mystery of life's journey and the unexpected unfoldment of a life. And I've had the holy privilege, literally, of being able, uh, being raised biculturally and coming from an immigrant family from uh, the mountains, the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain, and um, my father getting his American citizenship uh, when I was um, 14 years old. And um, so I came into my early 20s, um, literally, um, in a country uh, that had six movements ha happening simultaneously when I was um, a 21, uh, which was in 1963. Um, and... Uh, the civil rights movement, uh, the humanistic movement, uh, the environmental movement, the interfaith movement, the humanistic psychology movement, and the feminist movement were all happening in grand convergence and confluence uh, with one another. And it was also a wonderful time now that some uh, 50 years later that uh, those, there's such a confluence in the world, uh, those movements no longer being singular, but bridging and converging uh, together. And um, five years ago, I was struck uh, by uh, having a whole life journey of literally working internationally for almost 50 years and uh, being privileged to really work with indigenous uh, wisdoms worldwide and um, conserving and preserving literally the ancient wisdom that's often land-based and that we're in a world right now that's uh, somewhat divided in that half of the world we have uh, human beings uh, working um, and living on two two dollars a day and we have the other half of the world uh, which we call the postmodern world and we're poised at a wonderful time in history of where the intergenerations can come together uh, and that we can uh, spread uh, uh, more equi uh, equity and uh, equality uh, into the world and so five years ago, um, I became very stunned by a horrific uh, statistic that the United States holds. Um, and that statistic was that um, the United States has the highest suicide rate between its youth and its elders than any other culture in the world. And so I thought, well, why would that be uh, just from a cross-cultural point of view and being a cultural anthropologist and really looking at all of the cultures of the world and focusing on what do we u universally have in common as human beings. And we happen to be not only the youngest country in the world, uh, but also uh, the most ageist country in the world and that we divide and learn in age groups rather than uh, and segregate out. And so we do not, in many ways, call on the incredible creativity and vision and life force of our, our youth for problem solving. And we do not call on the experience and wisdom of our elders. And just in the last 10 years, we've been beginning to build those intergenerational bridges because every other culture of the world is, is in a, a more um, intergenerational sharing uh, together. And so I began taking a, a look at 
at uh, cross-culturally. What are the things that we share, whether we're youth, which from a global perspective, youth is from the ages of, of 1 to 35, from a global perspective. And that midlife, from a global perspective, is from uh, 35 to 50. And then we have the decade of the 50s, which often is the decade that's called the integrative decade of integrating the best of youth and the best of midlife and preparing for, quote, the wisdom years, which begin in the decade of our 60s. In the 60s, uh, we happen to be, uh, that's the youth of our wisdom years. Our 70s are the midlife of our wisdom years, but 80 to 100 is where we really come into our wisdom years or in our elderhood. And so it's also uh, that regardless of what generation we're in, that every decade of our life, there are, are, there's a gift of that decade, there's also the challenge of that de decade of our life, and there's also an important stranger uh, in that decade as well. And the four great mysteries that every culture of the world uh, ritualizes. There's not a culture in the world that does not ritualize birth. There's not a culture in the world that does not ritualize initiatory processes. There's not a culture in the world that does not ritualize marriage or committed love. There's not a culture in the world that doesn't ritualize death. And Death and birth um, hold the ends of a, the luminous pause that's called our life's journey, where every person has a call and goes into the next phase, which is the search. And after the search, goes into a struggle. And after the struggle, goes through the breakthrough. And then after the breakthrough is the return, and we keep recycling uh, through the call, the search, the struggle, the breakthrough, and, and the return. And while we're doing this, we have from uh, the time that we were born, we have standing on our left a great companion that from our cradle to our coffin is on our left and another companion on our right, whether we're male or female, that's standing on our right and is a companion from birth to death as well. And on our left is our companion called death. And death asks us a question every single day. Are you using the great gift of life well? Are you using the great gift of life well? And our companion on our right is asking us another question at every age. Are you doing what you've come here to do? Are you doing what you've come here to do? And that companion is called destiny. Destiny is with us. And destiny does not mean fate. It's destination. It's a companion on our journey as we heed the call and move through the search and the struggle and the breakthrough and the return and continue that cycle through the four great mysteries of birth and initiation and marriage and committed love and death. And the human species is here for two purposes. One, to learn about love and to express love, and the other is to create and to serve and to contribute. And I love that in working with indigenous peoples of the world, uh, worldwide, uh, especially um, the Native Americans of this continent and of South America, they have a wonderful phrase that says, we're all original medicine. Uh, and I pondered that for a long time, thinking about what really was original medicine. And what's original medicine is when we think about, even with identical twins, that every human being on this planet, and I think this is such an awesome fact, that every human being on this planet, whether they're identical twins or triplets, has a unique imprint, 
a fingerprint. Every human being, if you would put our voices on a sonogram at this time and in this moment, every voice here would have its own original pattern and sonic, even with identical twins or triplets worldwide. And also ophthalmologists or eye doctors have long been interested that even with identical twins, that the coloration and the pigmentation of every eye is completely unique. And what does that say about the human species? Is that each one of us have our own original imprint to make. Each one of us have something very much to give voice to, and especially our life dream and our vision to bring that uh, calling, uh, that service, that original medicine uh, to earth. And that's why many of the indigenous languages of the world don't have a means for comparison. They do not compare because it would be a waste of time to compare if you actually know that you're original medicine, right? Uh, we have our own imprint, we have our own voice sonic, we have our own coloration of our eye, our own way of looking at things and seeing things. And it's a time, whether we're male or female, that it's important and imperative that we bring our voice uh, into the world. And if you were to go to a medicine man or a holy man or a shaman among uh, indigenous peoples worldwide, they'll ask you one of of four questions and when you go and you're complaining about being disheartened or dispirited or depressed, they would ask you one of four questions. When in your life did you stop singing? When in your life did you stop dancing or moving in your body? When in your life did you stop being enchanted by stories? and particularly your own life story? And when in your life did you stop being comforted by the sweet territory of silence? Because their belief is that wherever we stopped singing and wherever we stopped dancing or moving in our body or enchanted by story and particularly our own life story, and comforted by the sweet territory of silence is where we begin to experience soul loss or loss of spirit. And um, so it would be important to ask yourself the question, when did I stop singing or bringing my voice forward? Because that's where I began to be self-conscious or doubt myself or in some ways not really believe in my own imprint or my own sonic or my own vision uh, in some way. When did I stop moving in my body? Because all the cultures of the world have music, they have dance, uh, they have storytelling, they believe that storytelling is the oldest teaching healing art that we have. And all cultures in the world realize that in the sweet territory of silence, we discover and remember and recall the deepest mystery of who we are, the deepest mystery in contemplation and reflection. And we recognize that in many ways, life is a mystery to be lived rather than a problem uh, to be solved. And cross-culturally, there are four ways um, uh, all over the world uh, that um, we have. There's not a culture in the world, for example, that doesn't have the way of the warrior. And warrior is an old-fashioned term for leadership, uh, being visible, uh, leading, contributing, making your imprint into the world. Because all cultures of the world have leaders and laws of governance. There's not a culture in the world that does not. And that's called the way of the warrior or the way of leadership. And in order to be a leader, the first principle is that we have to show up, and to show up uh, with right use of power and skillful means and courage. And the three powers that we have 
cross-culturally, and it said that any human being in any culture, if they walk with these three powers, they cannot be ignored. And the first power is the power of presence. Walt Whitman said, we convince by our presence. The second power, uh, many of us have charisma and presence, but then we lose it on the second power when we open our mouths. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, someone's charming across the room and then they open their mouth and it just doesn't match uh, uh, at all. Uh, so... Um, a power of communication. Many of our politicians have great presence and charisma and their communication matches, but we lose, they lose it sometimes on the third power when we scratch our heads and wonder where their stand is. Uh, we're not sure about their stance. And we could say that Mother Teresa had all three powers. She certainly, she had presence, her communication, and you knew where she stood in the world. And Eleanor Roosevelt and in putting together the International Declaration of Human Rights, uh, you knew uh, where she stood and her power of communication and, and her presence. Her presence was so strong and her communication and her stance was so strong that every biography around Ele Eleanor Roosevelt describes two things about her, how utterly charming she was and how exquisitely beautiful and compassionate she was. And they always use the word beautiful. And she never saw herself as beautiful, but her spirit was so large that it transcended the body uh, structures. And uh, she is left with the mark of the three greatest adjectives that are ever applied to her are about charm, beauty, and compassion and brilliant, and brilliant, but the brilliant is tagged on, is tagged on. Uh, we can say Martin Luther King had all those three powers. We can say Gandhi had all three powers. And the second way that we have cross-culturally uh, is that, uh, is, is the way of the healer. There's not a culture in the world uh, that doesn't have a medical modality or a folk medicine model or the combination of the two. And the third uh, and the most healing force in the world is love and the four-chambered heart. And traditional peoples have actually have a label to those uh, um, chambers, the full heart, the strong heart, the open heart, and the clear heart. Uh, and the opposite of those four chambers is the opposite of the full heart is half-heartedness, and the opposite of the strong heart is weak-heartedness and conflict avoidance, and the opposite of the open heart is closed-heartedness, which shows us where our forgiveness work is, and the opposite of the... Um, uh, clear heart is the doubting or confused heart. And so it's important if we want to experience intimacy, which really means into me see, that we have the conditions of the full, strong, open, and clear heart. And the last two ways, we have to show up in order to know what, uh, with our three powers, in order to connect with heart, what has heart and meaning and the most healing force in the world is love and all the properties of love. And the third way is the way of the visionary, which is the ability to say what's so, when it's so, to tell the truth with compassion or without blame or judgment and to bring our creativity into the world and to say what we mean and do what we say. Children always track uh, saying what we mean and doing what we say, and when we don't, when they say, but you broke your promise, you broke your promise, and they track that worldwide, worldwide. And um, all our creativity and our gifts and talents, our life dream is the way of the visionary, all the creative arts, the performing arts are the way of the visionary, and the last way is the way of the teacher or the wisdom way. And there's not a culture in the world that doesn't have an educational system or a way of transmitting values and virtues and uh, also what has meaning. 
And so I leave you with the four principles that if we show up and we pay attention to what has heart and meaning and we tell the truth without blame or judgment or with compassion by saying what we mean, doing what we say and saying what's so, that we're able then to follow the last way, the wisdom way, is, which is to plan well and prepare well, but to be open to outcome and not attached to outcome. And so um, I wanted just to um, say that the one way that we can keep our hearts open is through one practice that's uh, shared globally, which is the heart is always open if we can give gratitude. It's impossible to give gratitude from a closed heart. Um, and so just the practice of gratitude every day. And so I want to thank all the speakers and uh, everyone who has come today very, very much and that we honor our ancestors because they've gone before us, the great grandfather, the grandfather, the father, the mother, the teacher, the lover, the mate, uh, the great grandmother and the great grand, uh, uh, the the great-grandmother, the grandmother, the mother, the teacher, the lover, uh, the mate. And they stand behind us, and they stand behind us every day saying, oh, maybe this one will be the one that will bring forward the good, true, and beautiful for all the past generations to come. Oh, maybe this one will break the harmful family patterns and the harmful cultural patterns. Oh, maybe this one will be the one. And we are the one. We are the one. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>